After I finished soldering in the resistors, I replaced the cover. Also got the high voltage cage seated on properly. It was kind of bent a little bit and all the screws were missing, so I dug up some screws so it's on there nice and secure. And then I decided that I really couldn't stand looking at this filthy chassis anymore, so I started doing a little bit of cleaning using a technique I've used in the past, which is simply to use a little bit of navel jelly. Got a little on this uh, cheapo glue brush here, and I'm just smearing it around just a little bit. And it does a fantastic job of loosening up the old dirt. Now you can just use a general purpose spray cleaner too, like Spray 9 or 409, but I tried that, and although it worked, it was taking a lot more effort than this navel jelly does. So, for example, smear it all around. Don't want to use a lot because you don't want it to start going through all these holes and have to deal with getting all that out. And uh, try not to get it down into the tube sockets either. This area I did a minute or two before I started recording, so this, all this is completely freed up now. And then I take a cloth a little bit of just water on it, clean water, and wipe it off. And there we go, nice and clean. And I suggest you take a second cloth with water on it and wipe it down again. Now, in the past when I've left it like this, especially if it was just bare steel, it'll get kind of a, um, a, a bit of a corrosion haze on it after a few days. So, um, you could do another application on navel jelly and kind of go back and forth fighting it. Maybe put a little bit of WD-40 or oil over it to prevent the corrosion. But recently I was reading online about a tip to use contact cleaner. And yeah, that actually does work quite well. I don't know for how long it'll work, but certainly over the course of a few weeks it seems to work fairly well. So after cleaning off the acid, spray that on. It evaporates pretty quick, but I try to get in there pretty quick with a, with a towel, and that does a nice job, too, of getting rid of any remaining residue. And I guess um, because of the solvents and, and whatnot in here, it kind of drives out any last traces of moisture, and I think leaves a bit of a protective film on there as well. Under all that gunk, the cadmium plating is in surprisingly good condition. I've only found a few areas so far where the plating is worn away to expose bare steel. And there's a little bit of rust corrosion there, but the navel jelly took care of that. Uh, one thing I don't like, though, is that the wires to the yoke are not in the greatest condition. Two of them are also especially short, so I just barely move it. So I think I'm going to replace a couple wires while I've got this out. This cardboard housing should come off fairly easily. They're usually stapled in a couple spots. And that will also give me a chance to check the resistors that are inside there. There's two 560 ohm carbon comp resistors. Yeah, there they are. And I wouldn't be surprised if those have drifted pretty far out of tolerance. Also, geez, I just realized there's actual printing on that. It's just so filthy, it's hard to see. kind of wonder if this might be a replacement. It's hard to say. I mean, it is an RCA part. But considering I've seen some other evidence of repairs in this set, uh, I don't know, because I, I just find it hard to believe that they would have had leads this short. Because you can just barely um, get this into position with the leads being this short going to it. A careful examination of that yoke cover revealed two itty bitty little staples, which I carefully removed because I want to reuse them. Now this cover comes right off. There's the two 560 ohm resistors, and there is a compensating capacitor for the horizontal windings. Now if I really wanted to check this yoke like I was trying to do earlier, now I could take these resistors out and I could use that yoke tester. 
But what I want to do is replace at least one of these wires, either this wire or this wire. The other two have plenty of slack, but the one right next to it is as tight as can be, which is kind of irritating. So, see, it goes up right over here. So, if I unsolder this end and unsolder the other end, I can run a new wire and add a few inches of uh, length to it. I ended up replacing three of the yoke wires. They all had bad breaks in them like this, where there were some strands internally that were starting to fray, so it was a pain to route the two to the horizontal and vertical centering controls, but I, th I threaded them through and I got it done. So now this is much better. Slack, but not too much slack. I mean, you don't want these signals going all over the place, but they're all about the same length now, so it can be positioned as needed. All right, uh, I think next one I want to do is pop this whole thing off and clean out all the gunk under there and put this back on. I just unmounted this control bracket for cleaning, which exposed the surface that had been protected from the atmosphere all these years. You can see how bright that cadmium plating must have been when it was brand new. I hate when they do that. The high voltage lead goes through a hole in the high voltage cage that was riveted in place. <laughs> you can't oops, so readily lift this away. As I'm talking about. And uh, you can't push this through the hole unless. I heat up the end of this and pull the high voltage wire out of it. Otherwise, I can put it on the side for more like to clean this. Eh, I think I better on side of it. Lug. There we go. That wasn't too bad. I think I referred to this as a lug a moment ago. What I meant was the high voltage anode connection. The High voltage wire comes up through this, goes through the end, and there's a little solder cup down in there. So I just heat that up, pull the wire through, and now this out of the way. And this is why I wanted to expose it, because this is just filthy. Especially down in here, common issues to start getting corona arcing down in there because of all the dust gets attracted over the years. But a little brush and compressed air will take care of all that. Alright, I think that's looking a lot better now. And it really wasn't all that difficult to do. You just need to take your time and take some notes so you know how to put it back together because not all these nuts and bolts and screws are the same. Now, now that this side is cleaned up, I'm going to remount the stuff and get in from this side because it's still a little bit over here. I can't quite get at because I got the fly back and the high voltage socket bent over this way. When I bring them back over this way, I can get it the other side. To clean this out down in here, I just sprayed it with some electrical parts degreaser and then the contact cleaner and it seemed to flush everything out pretty well. There are a couple resistors down there, and I better double check those before I seal things back up. And it's either a 3.3 or a 0.33 ohm resistor that's used, I think, to limit the 
filament current of the 1B3 rectifier and that it looks like it's a 1 meg 1 watt power resistor that's in line with the high voltage lead and I've encountered that uh, being bad before in other sets I think that's also there to limit the current going to the cathode ray tube I finished cleaning up the high voltage area, put in some good tubes, and now I'm going to reattach the high voltage cage, and then I'll thread through the high voltage wire and reattach the anode cap. While cleaning down inside the high voltage cage, I found this, which turns out is one of the missing mounting brackets. This is for the focus coil support. On the other side, a wing nut's supposed to be there, so I picked some up at a local hardware store. The other side, I'll just use a regular old screw. Be nice to find one of these, but I just don't have anything like this lying around. I just finished remounting the focus coil and yoke. I ended up finding these little thumb screws in my local hardware store. Not quite the same as the original, but they'll do for now. Hopefully I'll come across some of these older style one of these days. Now I just need to clean up a little bit on this side, and then I'll start thinking about actually recapping this set. I finally remembered that I fairly recently picked up an RCA parts chassis. I think it was a model ET241. So I just went up into the attic and harvested some of these nice uh, wing screws, I guess they're called, which are exactly the same as what would have been here originally. So I can take out those crappy modern versions that I found in a local hardware store and put in some nice original type. I will say though, I did uh, do a quick search online, and uh, they do make modern versions of this that are fairly similar. I think uh, like fastenall.com carries them. And, uh, I think they're, they are called wing screws. I think I was calling them thumb screws earlier. I guess that's what actually these would be. These are like thumb screws, but when they got these wings on them, you see like you got, you got wing nuts. I can put on here, and these are wing screws. I placed an order with Mauser Electronics for what I hope are all of the resistors and capacitors I'm going to need to get this set running. In addition to the usual 630 volt plastic film caps and metal oxide resistors that I like to use, I also ordered up some interesting new electrolytic capacitors by Nichicon. Now you've seen me use Nichicon caps plenty of times before. Well, they are steadily evolving. So, here's a cap I might have used three or four years ago. And they then came out with the same thing, skinny size, but similar if not better ratings. High temperature, long life. Well now check this out. <laughs> they call these pencil caps, and they have fantastic specs not only 105 degrees Celsius but really really long life 10,000 hours and really high ripple current a little expensive but you know less than a sprig atom would cost so got a few of these now they don't uh, have a huge range of values I think the smallest you can get is 18 microfarad and they only come I think at 450 volt flavors so I only got a few of them, and for the other caps I got more conventional ones, but uh, they're still skinny. They're just not this ridiculously skinny type. Now, I have mentioned many times in past videos about how I like to get capacitors that have a higher voltage rating than were originally specified, or 105 degrees Celsius. But I've never really backed that up with any science as to why that matters. Well, in an upcoming video, I am going to tell you exactly why, because I found some great formulas online that explain the science behind why you want to do that when you can, to extend the life of your capacitors. 
As far as performing the actual recapping goes, I have decided that I do want to restuff the old paper caps. This is a really early set, it's a notable model, and most of the original caps are still here, so why not? I'll use the same process that I showed in numerous old videos, most recently in my Philco 3862 restoration. Clip out the old cap, heat it up with a heat gun, slide out the insides, Pop in the new cap, seal up the ends with brown hot glue, put it back in the set. Now my problem with that is that some of the original caps are gone. Most notably these two bright green ones here. Well, I went back up in the attic and checked out my RCA parts chassis. But it's a little bit newer and most of the caps in that were bumblebee type caps. I can only find six paper caps. But none of these are the right values for these two. But over the years, I've clipped out and saved many paper caps, so I'll go digging through my box and see what I can uh, come up with. I also want to restuff the electrolytic cans, which uh, are going to be a little tricky to get out, or at least this one will be. But I got some advice online, and they assure me that it is possible to get this out without having to unmount this bracket, which is pretty tricky because the bolts go up through the power transformer and are not easy to get at. I just want to make sure I'm very careful not to break these bases because these cans are not connected to this ground. They're floating and they have insulating wafers that are somewhat fragile. So I'm going to carefully unsolder the connections going to the, ca to the uh, cap, untwist the twist lock tabs, and then hopefully there's enough clearance between the top of this can and the centering pot that I can um, pop it loose from the base and then angle it and, and slide it out. Now I warn you, it may be a little while before I get around to actually doing this recapping. In fact, most of the footage you just saw was recorded over a month ago, and then I got sidetracked by other projects. Uh, well, actually what really happened is what usually happens when I'm working on stuff is I have to wait for stuff. Like I ordered the power resistors and I ordered up these caps and resistors for Mauser. And while waiting for those, I went back to working on other things. So I really want to get back to finishing off the Philco 15DX. Speakers are close to being done. And I also have been working on the GE coaxial set and that's about half done. I want to knock these projects out, clear off the workbench before I dive into this because I know this is going to take a while. It's going to be a rather involved project. So probably the most complex TV I've restored to date. I want to take my time on it. Also, give you a little tease that I'm going on a couple expeditions over the weekend. And come Monday, I hope to have a very interesting video to show. But uh, that's all I'm going to say for now.